Hello, and welcome to the Argyle HR Technology Leadership Forum. My name is Nick Ciavada with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have some important information to share with you, and then we'll turn the floor over to our esteemed opening keynote speaker. First, we would like to take a moment to thank today's sponsors, UKG, Eightfold AI, UiPath, GP, Workday, and Expert HR. Our sponsors are all committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. We also welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please use the hashtag Argyle Digital and follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. Also, be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I would like to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we have curated based on the feedback we have received over the years from our members. We have worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you. So during each session, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box on your screen. Following each presentation, we have set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. Thank you again for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Alex Smith. We are excited to have Alex for her opening keynote presentation titled, Towards a Fairer Workplace with HR Technology. Welcome, Alex. Over to you. Thank you so much, Nicholas, and good morning or good afternoon to anyone uh, here on this call. It is a pleasure for me to talk about what is near and dear to my heart, which is how do we continue to strive for a fair and equitable workplace? Uh, and HR technology is a wonderful tool uh, that can bring about a, a number of different opportunities of understanding, collaboration, and most importantly, equity and fairness in your organization. And we're gonna talk about a little bit how that can really make a difference um, through a number of different pathways. So to tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Alex Smith. I have been uh, in HR for over 20 years. I have my master's in HR, my BA in economics. I've worked in public and private sector, and I am very committed and passionate uh, and impassioned about working and helping and serving those in the community. I think that that's an important component because I see HR work as not just about the care and feeding of employees, but the care and feeding of those around our, our companies, around our communities, uh, making sure that we are doing our part as an organization to make lives better. I'm also a working mom. And so in every presentation I do, I have to give kudos and a shout out to my two beautiful daughters, Sasha and Sabrina, um, that are very supportive of me uh, as a mother. Uh, and for me as an HR professional, I see it as being critical uh, to pass it forward and for them to see me as an example of what they can be. And, and of course, uh, all the options available to them. So to kick us off, this quote from Jack Welsh, I think, really sums it up. Before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. And so a key component in understanding how we can make a difference in creating a fair workplace has to do with how do you grow and develop and teach others about this idea around equity. And how do you embed it in your organization? Because it's one thing for you to have it as a mission statement on your wall or a vision statement, or even just to uh, put it as a part of your, your speeches as leaders. But it's another thing for you to really live it and act it out as a leader. And more importantly, encourage others in your organization to do the same thing. And so here's an important lesson in equity. I learned very early on. So uh, I am the chief HR officer for the city of Memphis, public sector entity uh, with over 7,800 employees. And when I started with the organization seven, seven and a half years ago, there were a number of challenges in terms of morale, in terms of how to really bring about more performance-based culture in the organization. 
And the new mayor uh, that came in wanted to bring uh, new perspectives on how to do this. And so uh, as the new HR leader coming from the private sector, I had an important perspective about what it would take in order to help bring about this new change and, and uh, new perspective into the organization. So quickly I saw uh, as I, we were seeking to implement different things that we were in a very difficult situation. And one was that we had a number of manual and paper processes that really made it difficult for us to move things forward. Uh, secondly, it was a burden to many of the divisions in, in terms of how to uh, get things done. But most importantly, it really took up capacity because there, it took time and effort to move uh, different files around and, and get signatures and all these things. So qu very quickly, very uh, early in my tenure, it was very clear to me that we needed to move to a, a paperless organization, not just for the sake of doing it, but for the sake of being able to free up capacity so that we could really focus in on the work that needed to be done. And so that's what we did. Uh, I, I charged the team with going paperless by December 2020, and the team worked really hard and diligently in doing that and looked at a number of different processes to do that. One process that the team brought to my attention that we need to focus on was the carryover vacation. Now, you would say in most companies, carryover vacation is easy, it's automatic, um, there, you know, people don't even think about it. But at the time, many years ago in the city of Memphis, uh, there was a challenge, which was that carryover vacation was based on uh, anyone who completed a form. Uh, and the form had to be signed by multiple people, as you can see here, the supervisor, the division director, the director of human resources. And so, uh, first, the employee had to find the form. <laughs> Secondly, they had to fill it out. And um, one of the things that my team brought to my attention was that not everybody knew where the forms were. Not everyone um, had uh, access and availability uh, to be able to sign the forms. And uh, the form was signed based on division director discretion. And so a number of issues came up around that. Um, one was around equity. So you had some people who had access to forms, some people who didn't, some people who had access to the director, some people that didn't. And so that meant that it was not a fair playing field for everyone to be able to have their vacation carried over, uh, which has a number of implications. And one of it being people being able to spend time with their families and achieve work-life balance. And so this was an important form that we needed to automate, not just because we need to go paperless to free up capacity, but because it meant that we needed to create an opportunity where everyone had equal access. And by automating this form and being able to make it available to everyone, we opened the door to, to equal access and equal opportunity for our employees. And so this is just one example around some of the, the simple processes that you could have in your organization that can present fairness challenges. And it's important as leaders that we make sure we take a look at that uh, it's sometimes it's just things that we've always done this way. Um, and it, it's just simple to just keep going with the same processes they always done. But I would encourage you to, for, you, for you to really look at what really is going on and are there underlying biases happening? Are there underlying issues that are happening uh, as a result that could be keeping you from having the fair and equitable workplace that you're looking at? For example, favoritism. So as I mentioned with this one particular form, the division director had to sign off. So there was a perception that if the division director liked you, he would sign or she would sign it. If they didn't, they wouldn't sign it. And particularly for something like carryover vacation, it shouldn't be about whether or not somebody likes you. It should be whether or not you have the time availability and the business can accommodate it. Uh, protectionism. We saw issues as we were looking to uh, open up and um, being able to advance our, our programs and, and move into this paperless world, that we had certain groups that didn't want to participate because they didn't want to share their information. And it became more of an issue of protecting what they thought was their territory than it was about what was the greater good for the organization. Once again, creating uh, issues in terms of fairness and access uh, for particular processes or knowledge and information across certain teams. And then an issue of bias as well. Uh, so you can uh, run into situations where people will say, well, so-and-so can't be 
uh, the next uh, head of a division or the next, you know, whatever uh, role it might be uh, because of some characteristic. And of course, you know, those are all things that are against Title VII, but the, the main point is that you can have these interesting fairness challenges in your organization and technology can, can do something amazing. It can allow for you to really address these issues related to access, related to um, being able to make sure that everyone has equal opportunity and open the door so that you can truly address these fairness challenges and make sure that you resolve them for your organizations. And so what does that look like? So we talk about the issue of access. Uh, people not having equal access to different information, different opportunities, your applicant tracking system choice, your learning management system choice, even employee self-service. These are all technology solutions that can really break down that barrier and allow for all employees to be able to have equal access to everything that you want them to have in the organization and then not just be hindered completely on or hinged completely on uh, what a, a particular leader thinks or what a, a manager thinks, but that there is opportunity. Also the ability to be more adaptable. So this idea of being able to create more flexibility for your employees, uh, there are certain important pieces around investing in employee benefits and programs that can help support that, like a flexible work arrangement program, but also collaborative collaborative tools like Microsoft Teams or Zoom or uh, other, uh, other tools, that all of those things can make a difference in being able to be more flexible and uh, create an environment where employees can meet and work anywhere, anytime. And then the most important, I think, for us, particularly in wanting to advance a more performance-based culture, this, uh, this idea around growth. And so how can we get access bet to better data and better decisions across our organization? And so the process of actually going through a technology implementation and really having your teams work through what works and what doesn't uh, and what is a, you know, aspire to state for your organization in which our processes should be uh, can make a huge difference in being able to bring about growth and understanding your organizations, as well as reporting analytics and overall skill development. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And this can really make a difference in helping your organization achieve your overall goals, not only around fairness and equity, but in access, adaptability, and growth. So the Memphis story, as I mentioned, head of HR for the city of Memphis for the last seven and a half years, and we have, um, implemented a number of pieces of technology to help us go paperless. But what we discovered is the importance of that process, the process of identifying what are the issues, identifying where the fairness challenges are, identifying where our even talent and skill gaps are, and then making sure that we have a, a focus on how do we solve for that and leveraging HR technology and HR technology implementations as a, a way to do that. So the first component, that equal access to opportunities, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, one perfect example is related to our uh, applications. So uh, before 2016, um, there were a number of, of positions that had paper applications uh, where you physically had to go to a site to be able to get an application to apply for a job. We moved into the space of having a uh, online applicant tracking system and online presence for all of our job postings. And so that in itself created this opening for people uh, all over the, the city as well as all over the world, now well, but all over the nation to be able to take a look at our roles and be able to apply to them uh, and giving us access to be able to look at different talent from across the country. So that equal access to opportunities really can be um, expounded upon by having the right technology in your organization and allowing for that equal, that equal access, as well as being able to increase visibility for your organization, particularly for certain hard to fill jobs. The other component for us was around how could we expand learning and development? So we talk about growth and wanting to create a performance culture. Well, you can't do that if you don't have the right tools, the right training, the right understanding around what are important competencies. And so when we started, uh, there were some challenges related to not having consistent training available, not having consistent performance management system, not having even competencies that we were clear that were important for management and leadership. 
And so over time, as we look to build out our HR technology platforms, we were able to get even more in depth of understanding, okay, what is the technology and how can we bring access to it uh, to that, te that uh, technology and that training through a learning management system? How could we make sure that we had equitable access to it by having both online and virtual training as well as in-person training? And then how can we make sure employees were getting good feedback from their managers and equitable feedback from their managers in terms of making sure that across every division that there was a platform for people to be able to have conversations um, between managers and employees. So being able to institute a performance management program and using the technology to be able to help facilitate that. All of that was important in helping us be able to evolve our talent management practices in our organization, but most importantly, help us continue to extend this idea around fairness and access to opportunity. Another important component around HR tech and fairness is around meeting and working anywhere, anytime. And I know we all particularly saw this during the pandemic, but even before that, uh, I think there's an important component of understanding that this idea of creating adaptable and flexible workplaces is what the next generation, particularly the, the Gen Z generation is particularly looking for. And so I think it's an advantage point for all of us to be looking at that. But as I mentioned, the pandemic really helped to open our eyes about the importance of adaptability and flexibility. And it was a, I would call it a mission critical must have uh, in order for us to kind of have, operate as a business. What we found was that the ability to be able to have technology that, that people could do from home, um, that we could be able to make sure that we could uh, spread work and be able to, to look um, more effectively across the divisions made a huge difference in us being able to grow and develop talent, uh, also be able to tap into different talent, uh, but more importantly, being able to create equal access to talent uh, and opportunities across our organization. And so what happened for us uh, was that uh, we were able to really embark on this idea of people being able to work anywhere, anytime. And so everything from our web conferencing capabilities uh, to even improving our website and intranet capabilities as well to be able to provide more information. And of course, this was important as many of you know, policies were changing often um, because CDC guidance was changing. And so being able to have a source of truth for our employees of where they could go and get information and insight was important. But of course, you had to have the infrastructure for a website and for internet for that to work. And so that's why investments in these technologies can be very important. In addition to, as I mentioned, the flexible work arrangements and the ability for telecommuting. We also were able to venture into these other spaces of virtual onboarding, virtual training, uh, expanding our uh, performance management program into employee check-ins, contact tracing even, having virtual student hubs. All of these concepts were enabled by our ability by having this technology that we could use, where, whether it was um, building a check-in system um, or a, uh, a sign-up uh, process of making it easy for people to sign up for different opportunities training, being able to be virtual and being able to manage that through our LMS system, um, being able to do the contact tracing and using shared uh, collaboration tools and shared forms. Um, all of that was able to be able because we had the technology and once again, being able to provide that equal access to it. And then lastly, better data, better decisions. And I think in general, as organizations, we're looking for uh, our employees to have a growth mindset and helping us to think through uh, and problem solve some of our toughest challenges. Well, you can't really problem solve if you don't have all the data, or at least you don't have some data. And it's hard for you to make really great decisions without having the data in the first place. So using the HR technology to be able to have this access to, to the data uh, and being able to uh, analyze it and talk about it, uh, see where the trends are, has made a huge difference. And as I mentioned, also the ability to free up capacity. So as I, as I talked about before, in 2016, I challenged my team to go paperless by December 2020. And the important component around that, as I mentioned, was this idea of how can we get each individual team member to work together in order to look at what's the right technology needed and so that process of them evaluating what they currently were doing and then what could be improved through technology was an important component, allowing for everyone to participate in that process. 
but also this idea that we could innovate and we could look and think about and dream about something different in our organization and using that insight to help us make better decisions about how we could evolve our HR model and how we could use the data that we receive from now these new reports and things that we have access to, to make better decisions for how we serve our employees, our retirees, our candidates. All of that was pivotal in being able to help us move really across a transformation in our organization and be successful. And so everything from our performance management program, where we were able to go from a paper-based program to a cloud-based system and evolve our participation with that program. Uh, we also were able to look at how we can make more investments in training, how we could help instill more around performance and relationship culture show recognition in different ways. So um, everything from online kudos to how we could do things in person and optimize the manager employee relationship because we were making it easier for people to be able to have conversations and be able to really uh, focus in uh, on the relationship to be able to achieve the performance and the growth that we were looking for. So to, to summarize and wrap up, I think that HR technology can make a huge difference in helping our organizations be successful in achieving the equity and the, and the fairness that we're looking for. It does a few important things. And, and, and most importantly, it helps us build trust, build trust with our employees, build trust with the community because of that ability to have access, because you're able to create you know, opportunities for adaptability and for growth. And so equal access to opportunities through your different uh, applicant tracking systems, learning management systems, employee self-service, the adaptability that you can be able to provide through your flexible work arrangement programs and other collaborative tools that help with team and team building. And then being able to have better data and better decisions through the process of implementation, but also the additional reporting and analytics that you can have access to as an organization. And of course, the overall growth and skill development for our employees. The key to being able to really do this and be successful is you have to have courage, vision, and commitment. And that courage to be able to make the investments in the technology up front the vision to see what can be possible and to continue to push your teams to do that. And of course, the commitment to stick to it because it's not easy, it's not a linear process that you go through some ups and downs as you're going through an implementation, but it's through that commitment that you will find true success. Also to wrap up, uh, the top four things I would recommend that are important to building a fair workplace to help you really get started. So one is, be clear about the purpose, vision, and values for your organization and what you're trying to achieve in terms of building a fair and equitable workplace. Number two, be willing and open to question the status quo and how to look at how we can do things in a more efficient way, uh, how we can do things differently in order to achieve. It doesn't mean you have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't mean that you have to completely demolish everything. But what it does mean is that you can take a surgical approach to look at, okay, what's not working and where can HR technology really help us make things better and make a difference? You have to identify resources. To be able to do any implementation of technology, you, it's gonna require people, it's gonna require capital, uh, it's going to require investment in time and energy. Uh, and so you must identify those resources that can do that. Sometimes it means you might have to get outside project managers to come and help um, because your team already has a pretty heavy workload. So they may not be able to do some of the full project management work. But identifying those resources up front will help you be successful. And then lastly, you must be committed, committed to continuous improvement because there are gonna be ups and downs with it, but this idea of continuing to um, look, push forward, look for momentum and seek to get better will make a huge, huge difference. So with that, I will stop for questions. Great, uh, excellent. We have a question from the audience, Alex. What's the biggest mistake you've seen companies make in trying to use HR technology to create a fairer workplace? 
So I think the biggest mistake that companies make is not investing in the change management process. And so it is important that you uh, go through the steps of communicating your whys and the burning platform for why this technology is important and will make a difference. Uh, getting feedback from the different leaders about what's going on, what the problems are, and being able to speak directly to how the technology will make a difference there. I think the, the second biggest issue um, that I've seen is under-resourcing. I think sometimes people think, oh, okay, well, the subscription fee is this, and so that's all we have to do. But no, it's, it's more commitment than that. There's not only the actual capital that's needed for the technology itself, but there's the people resources needed to be able to be on the project team, to be able to do the UAT testing and all these uh, components. Um, and so being able to make sure you have enough of people on the inside that can help, uh, or as I mentioned before, identifying um, capital to be able to, to hire project managers to be able to support you, uh, because it's important that it's done right. Uh, you, you don't just want to pay a subscription and, and hope that it works. Uh, you want to make sure you have a good implementation plan, good implementers, uh, and a team that's engaged to be able to make sure that the implementation goes well. Great. Uh, and another question uh, from an audience member. What are you doing to raise awareness of how bias can affect decision making and actions that leaders can take to improve a more inclusive mindset? Excellent question. So there's two important things that we've added in, uh, and that and I would recommend this for any organization. Number one, have a mandatory uh, hiring manager training or interviewer training uh, for anyone that's going to be interviewing uh, in your organization. And in that mandatory training, you can cover not only uh, the Title VII and EEO uh, related components, but you can really talk about what's the overall um, important cultural values that you want to achieve in your organization and make sure that everyone has the same understanding and expectation who's going to be participating in the interview or process. The second piece is continuing to have at least annual training around implicit bias and making sure that people understand what implicit bias looks like uh, and how to call it out uh, and to address it uh, and continuing to have that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, always have your uh, employee relations or, or uh, other HR business partner teams uh, be able to do refresher uh, training uh, in your individual divisions, uh, as well as make sure you have a clear, safe place for employees uh, to be able to raise concerns if they have any. Well, thank you again, Alex, for an excellent keynote. I also want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Have a great day, everyone.